Let's get started here. Uh, I've gotten to know today's speaker over the past few years, and mostly, I guess, in historic circles. Uh, it seems he's been involved in everything historic for many years now. Uh, he's a retired school teacher for the Olympia School District and loves being the PA announcer for sporting events. I remember that about him. And uh, he's been very involved in the historic commissions for Thurston County, Olympia, and currently the chair of the Tumwater Historic Preservation Commission. In fact, we have a meeting tonight about that. And uh, let's see, we, his education background and ability working with people has also led him to lead tours of the state capitol. Uh, he's helped us with our summer riverwalk tours along the Deschutes, and he's also developed a driving tour of Thurston County's historic sites, of which he'll be sharing part of that uh, for this talk here. In fact, I got a special sneak preview of the, of the photos just a couple days ago, so I, th I know you're going to enjoy this. So let's give you, or have you give him a historic welcome. I introduce to you Dave Shipley. Historical or hysterical? I always got a kick out of those terms. Well, I am all humbled to see so many people here. Um, I, I'm no longer on one of the historic commissions after 30, almost 30 years. I'm no longer on the Thurston County Historic Commission. I was chair for 28 years of that. Um, but I'm still chair of the um, Tumwater uh, Historic Commission. I absolutely love it and used to be a chair of the Olympia Heritage Commission as well. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and get started. Uh, this was primarily to be in conjunction with a brochure that I was hoping that the county would uh, publish, but because of funds and funding and they are coming out with a book, uh, the funding wasn't there. I decided to go ahead and put together a slideshow that goes with my proposed route of a th uh, county tour by automobile. This is only one half of it. So if I'm good, you can invite me back, and I'll show you the other half, which is the, the eastern part. And I, in the last couple of days, I decided I need to do something in a way of a visual other than slides. So I put together a map, uh, and I outlined it for you and highlighted it in two colors, and it'll give you an idea uh, that I'm doing it counterclockwise in a county. And if you did the whole tour, believe it or not, you'd not leave the county once, but you'd put in about 150 miles on your automobile. It's uh, amazing, and I don't even go to the Bald Hills, if you know where that is, in the southeastern corner. Um, so it's a, a, a labor of love, and I'm absolutely thrilled to uh, show you the uh, historical sites of Thurston County, and this particular one is in um, the western section. So. To start with, this slideshow will be an overview of several historical sites and historical markers essentially in the western and southern portions of Thurston County, outside of Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater. I did not include the three major cities. Um, I did not feel that an automobile could be driven safely and look at historical sites in three cities. So this is strictly in the rural area. My goals are to encourage you to, to tour the county to see its beauty to possibly learn more about the county's history and visit sites that you have not seen or have not visited for a while. I preface this presentation by saying I do not consider myself a historian, but I rather consider myself a person interested in history, if you know the difference there. The county's namesake was Samuel Thurston, the first delegate from Oregon Territory to Congress. He arrived in 1847 before Oregon Territory was created in 1848. And following the Oregon Treaty of 1846 with England, he worked diligently for the Oregon settlers, including pushing through the donation land claim law of 1850, establishing mail routes and post offices as well as lighthouses, and obtaining pe pensions for War of 1812 veterans, many of whom lived in the Oregon Territory. Oh, I should also preface this by saying um, this is a, a program that was made on an Apple computer. It will not work with our system here, so I'm using a PC type of thing. You're going to see some glitches in here, particularly a printout of some uh, writing. It uh, doesn't recognize it in the PC, so I'll read it to you or do something different. But anyway, there'll be a couple glitches in there, so I apologize for not telling you earlier. Anyway, returning home in 1851, he contracted a fever died at sea at age 35, was buried in Alcapuco initially, but then later reburied in Salem, Oregon. The County Historic Commission has actually placed a marker on his gravesite in Oregon about his namesake county up here in Washington. 
Allow me to show you a few selected facts about Thurston County. Michael T. Simmons, an early settler of your Tumwater, was proposed to be the source of the name of the new county, but he urged that it be named to memorialize Samuel Thurston, so you were going to be named as living in Simmons you know, County rather than Thurston County. It was a large county. It went from Willapa Bay to the Canadian border and from the Cascade Mountains to the Pacific Ocean. The county was created in 1852 by the Oregon Territorial Government, the fourth oldest county now in our state. Washington Territory is created in 1853, and the current borders of the county were finalized in 1877. The county now ranks 32nd in size out of the 39 counties in our state and ranks number six in population. Olympia has always been the county seat of Thurston County, as well as always been the capital of Washington. This is a part where it kind of goes a long ways off, so I apologize on that one. Perhaps surprising to some, the highest point in the county is called Quimuth Peak, named after a leader of the Nisqually tribe and brother of Leshi. The County Historic Commission proposed the name. The forested hill with an elevation of 2,922 feet is located in the southeast corner of the county near Alder Lake and the town of Alby. Big Larch Mountain and Capitol Peak in the Back Hills are in the state capital forest are both about 260 feet lower in elevation. This sign is relatively difficult to read beside Capitol Lake and Heritage Park unless you are willing to lie down or kneel on the gravel pathway. <laughs> they didn't listen to me when I tried to not get them to do it that way. But anyway, all 39 counties on our state have a similar marker in alphabetical order. This sign mentions such things as a county seat, the date of creation, three local Native American tribes, the Mima Mounds, the Oregon Trail, and two colleges. The Thurston County Historic Commission over the years has posted several markers around the area which much of this presentation originates. This sign is actually in Grays Harbor County and it discusses the logging industry in the Black Hills. Meanwhile, this sign made by the county is located at both Interstate 5 rest stops located in our county and gives an overall view of the county's history. A second marker to be found at the Maytown rest stop covers some of the historic sites in the southern portions of the county, such as Rochester, Gate, Bucota, Grand Mound, Tonino, Little Rock, among other sites. And if you're heading north on Interstate 5 at the Scatter Creek rest stop, you will find this second marker that points out the history of Lacey, Olympia, and Tomwater. And what I'm going to do is encourage you to stop at the, two, at the three rest stops and take a look at these. My presentation will now follow a proposed automobile route through our county, which is going to start at the Mud Bay Park and Ride at, on Madrona Beach Road, where you will find several signs in the far left corner of the large parking lot. These three county markers discuss a variety of subjects, such as the Western Washington Logging Company that was started in 1899 by Mark Dram and in 1910 was renamed the Mud Bay Logging Company, which by then also included George Long and Dan O'Leary. The company obtained trees from the Black Hills using rail lines that stretched toward McClary, as well as Little Rock for a total of 80 miles in the northern and southeastern sections of Black Hills. The Bordeaux Brothers Logging Company built 90 miles of rail lines. They logged 50,000 acres and then at its peak produced 600,000 board feet. You get this? 600,000 board feet per day and employed 400. The town of Bordeaux was located west of Little Rock in the Black Hills. And if you know where Bordeaux Road is, that's where it's located. Douglas fir and hemlock and red cedar were dumped into the waters of Eld Inlet and taken to mills in Puget Sound, especially Everett. And this is all that remains of the long trestle seen from one side of Eld Inlet, but it's also clearly visible from the other side during low tide, of course. 
The trestle was built in the late 1800s. By the time the Mud Bay Logging Company ceased operations in 1941, it had logged 26,000 acres, harvested one and a half billion, that's with a B, billion feet of timber. And overall, the Black Hills produced six billion feet of logs. It is quite evident from these last three photos why Mud Bay might have gotten its name. The shellfish in the second display panel talks about Native Americans gathering shellfish in addition to several oyster companies that came with the arrival of newcomers, including the Olympia, Simmons, Ellison, and J.J. Brenner oyster companies. A French idea was adopted in a diking and filling oyster land to maintain a constant water level and improve production. However, sulfide, sulfide I should say, poisoning from Shelton Mills decimated the local oyster beds starting in the 1920s. The hardier Pacific oyster was introduced, and upon the closure of the mills, the tiny Native American, I'm sorry, tiny Native Olympia oyster has made a comeback. The third sign is about coastal Shalish descendants who have been in the area for thousands of years, gathering and harvesting various uh, plants and animals. The panel discusses the seven bands of the Squaxin tribe who lived along the seven inlets of South Puget Sound that we now call Case, Totten, Bud, Eld, Carr, Hammersley, and Henderson. The Indian Shaker Church was started in 1882 by the gentleman on the left, John Slocum, and his wife, Mary Slocum. Do not confuse this with the Shaker Church in eastern United States because there's no association whatsoever. The church contains a combination of American Indian beliefs, such as counterclockwise movement of service participants. It has Protestant beliefs, such as confession and public testifying. It has Catholic beliefs, such as holding candles and the sign of the cross. The Shaker Church Road overlooking Mud Bay is named after the Mother Church of the Indian Shaker Church. There are Indian Shaker churches located in Oregon, California, as well as British Columbia. The William Cannon Trail takes you to the shores of Mud Bay. It commemorates the first American to see Puget Sound. He's a former member of the John Jacob Astor expedition, but here in 1824, he was part of the Hudson's Bay Company expedition led by a Scot by the name of James McMillan, who went from Fort George, formerly called Fort Astoria, at the mouth of the Columbia River on the way to Fort uh, Fraser River in Canada. Across from this vantage point on Eld Inlet, you will see a welcoming pole that marks the site of an 11-year archaeological dig conducted on the property of the Ralph Monroe family under the direction of Dale Crows of the South Puget Sound Community College and accompanied by members of the Squaxin tribe. Several items discovered at the site are on display at the Squaxin Idol and Tribe Museum just south of Shelton. About a total of 170,000 cataloged items, such as fiber gill nets, baskets, and wooden artifacts were discovered that were found dating to 700 years. In addition, in the estuary, the remains of a fishing weir was located. These were constructed to capture fish as they swam in the numerous, numerous waterways. This county marker, near Mud Bay Road discusses the discovery of Eld Inlet by Peter Puget under the direction of George Vancouver of the Royal British Navy. Vancouver's ship was called HMS Discovery and the goals of the 1791 to 1795 expedition included a search for our Northwest Passage, a survey of the Pacific region, as well as sailing around the globe. This contour map above the reception desk at Providence Medical Center on the west side shows a few of the inlets of South Puget Sound, including the location of Eld Inlet. Peter Puget explored the area in 1792, along with a Lieutenant Joseph Whidbey, explored the southern stretches of the inland sea in two rowing boats that involved about 20 men. Puget originally called it Friendly Inlet because of the treatment he received from the local Squaxin Indians along the Eld Inlet. Accompanying Puget in this area were Archibald Menzies, who is a naturalist, as well as Whidbey. And Whidbey is Vancouver's sailing master, or navigator. 
Puget reached the end of Eld Inlet on May 26 in, in 1792. Many of the geographical names for Puget Sound geographical sites south of the Tacoma Narrows were named by Charles Wilkes. The Wilkes Expedition, officially called the United States Exploring Expedition of 1838 and 1842, explored parts of the Pacific Ocean and as well as the west coast of North America. Locally, he named the various inlets in northern Thurston County, including Bud Inlet, Eld Inlet, Henderson Inlet, Taunton Inlet, as well as Cooper Point. So on the screen you see where the names came from and where their connections were. Allison Spring is a water source for the city of Olympia. The name comes from Charles Allison, who formerly owned the springs. And what you're going to be doing largely is at this point, largely following south on Delphi Road, if you uh, are familiar where I'm at. This area has several places named after William McLean, who first arrived in the area in 1852, such as the school. In 1854, he returned east to marry Martha McLuhan, and then returned in May of 1855 and took up a claim of about 308 acres. He served two terms on the legislature in 1872 and 1876. The family also donated land for a cemetery, and it likewise is named after the McLean family. In addition, the McLean name is applied to the McLean Grange, former site of actually a school. I don't know if you knew that, but the Grange was established to serve as a gathering place and a means to gain information, such as on farming. A very popular Nature Walk on the west side is the McLean Nature Trail maintained by the Washington Department of Natural Resources located along McLean Creek. There are two loop trails that can be taken that include the former rail bed of a logging railroad, giving you the opportunity of viewing several beaver ponds that contain a variety of wildlife such as newts and ducks in addition to a forest with tree stumps revealing notches where the springboards were inserted by loggers. The Delphi School further down the road was built in 1910 to serve children of the Mud Bay Logging Company. The company donated the land for the school which closed in 1942 and is now used by the Delphi Community Club. The word Delphi incidentally means place of the gods. Along Wad Waddle Creek Road, named after Robert and Susan Waddle, who arrived in the county in November of 1852 and filed a 320-acre donation land claim along the creek, there is a cemetery that was on once owned by the First United Methodist Church of Olympia, but is now maintained by people in the local area. It has also been called Stony Creek Cemetery because of the stream by that name goes nearby. Capital Forest consists of 90,000 acres of timber and a 50 million year old Black Hills, an extension of the Willapa Hills of southwestern Washington. The land was logged by the Mason County Logging Company, called the Bordeaux Brothers, Vance Lumbering Company, and the Mud Bay Logging Company. The forest suffered from fires in 1902, 1910, 1912, and 1919 that burned billions of board feet of timber. The State Forest Land Board in 1933 purchased about 33,000 acres for about 50 cents an acre and later added more acreage. A state reforestation project was begun in the 1930s with the help from the Civilian Conservation Corps. Altogether, seven million seedlings were planted between 1938 and 1942. It is now in multi-use status that includes horse and hiking and ATV trails as well as campgrounds and, of course, logging. Margaret McKinney was an accomplished naturalist who published guides on wild mushrooms, wildflowers, and birds. She has an Olympia grade school that was named after her. Mima Mounds is a term that is actually used worldwide. Here, we locally call it Mima Mounds but globally such mounds are called Mima-like mounds. And if you go into, this is a side light, not even in my nose, but if you go on Interstate 5 between Redding and Red Bluff, you'll see Mima mounds, uh, because I just came back from Arizona, I can vouch for it. You can see Mima mounds there as well. They're all over, but 
the name is applied from Thurston County, so it's global. The mounds range to a maximum height of 70 feet and a diameter of 6 to 70 feet of black pebbly silt and sand and gravel outwash. The prairie contains about 46 square miles. The name Mima is said to be an Indian word that means a little further along. As you will find out when you stop at the kiosk, there are several theories regarding how these plains with mounds came about, such as gophers, Indian burials, earthquakes, and glacier outwashes. Several people, early explorers and later arrivals, wrote about the prairie, including explorer Charles Wilkes, James Douglas of the Hudson's Bay Company, and an Arctic explorer by the name of Paul Kane. The discussion on how the Mayan Mounds were created has a very long history. And one prominent theory involves continental glaciers that terminated between Olympia and Centralia. Let's see, let me make sure I'm on the right side. Charles Willocks was first brought these mounds to national scientific attention following his U.S. exploration of the air in 1841. He named it Butte's Prairie. The red area areas in the bottom right corner shows the historic prairies, while the yellow shows the current prairies, so there's a large reduction. The 445-acre preserve is on the National Natural Landmark and consists of several walking trails through the prairie with mounds. The Mima Prairie Cemetery at the, on, off the gate Mima Road is on a land homesteaded by John and Mary Polly Gowen Laws, who came to Mima Prairie in the 1850s and he deeded the cemetery to the county in 1869. The cemetery was cleaned and documented by the Thurston County Historic Commission in 1989 and 1990 and is now maintain, maintained by the Weyerhaeuser Corporation. This company operates a large tree farm in Miami Prairie, and the company produces seedlings for um, replanting in the state. The county's bountiful byway program has signs in various locales, such as this one. The aim of the program is to promote agricultural tourism. Nearby is the Black River Miami Prairie Glacial Heritage Preserve. It's a 1,020-acre holding that preserves Puget Sound ecosystem of native plants and wildlife habitat that settlers in the 1800s would have seen. Only 3% of this type of ecosystem now remains. The area is generally closed to the public but is available for educational and environmental activities by contacting the county parks department. The town of Gate was founded in 1881 with the extension of the railroad through the area. It was platted in 1890 by Sam Woodruff of Olympia. When the Northern Pacific extended its line to Grace Harbor in 1890, a junction was made at, the, at Gate to connect it to Centralia and therefore Portland. At first it was called Gate City and then later simply Gate. The Gate School was built in 1910, fires in 1902 and 1918 destroyed much of the town and depletion of timber resources led to the closure of the mills with the school the only major building remaining. The school is now owned and maintained by the Gate Community Club and is on the state and national heritage registers. The Black River flows out of Black Lake, which is the largest natural lake in the county and empties into the Chehalis River. The name refers to the dark waters of Black Lake. It was a route utilized by Native Americans and later by Euro-Americans between the Chehalis River and Puget Sound by way of Black Lake. The Chehalis River, whose name means shifting sands or sand, was regarded by John Work in his journal with the Hudson's Bay Company's James McMillan Brigade, as well as naturalists such as David Douglas, the Douglas tr fir tree, the lowlands provided a drainage route when the continental glaciers melted. At one time, there were serious considerations in making a man-made water route from Gray's Harbor through this area to Puget Sound for maritime shipping, in other words, a canal. Rochester was platted in 1890 by Gailey Fleming of Centralia, who named it after her home of Rochester, Indiana. 
It was also named Key, possibly referring to Gate or Gate City. In 1904, the name Rochester was reapplied to the community at the suggestion of John Nye, who wanted to honor his hometown of Rochester, England. Notice New York's not in here. <laughs> the school building in the photo was built in 1936 and is all actually on the state and national heritage registers. Many of the early residents of southwestern Thurston County were of Swedish descent, and they formed the owner of Runeberg and built the hall in 1939 and 1940 through volunteer labor using recycled materials. Others of Scandinavian background also settled in the area. The Grand Mound is now a forested hill. It's about 125 feet in height and was once an island in a prehistoric lake. It's a landmark to Native Americans and early explorers. The Salish Indians used it as a meeting place, a burial ground, and site of a village. This marker was obviously being worked on when the photo was taken back in 2016, but I can vouch that today it still remains in disrepair. Leonard Durgan and his wife, Lucita, filed a claim in 1853, which included this high mound. He was a member of the first territorial legislature, and he advocated the construction of the Capitol building on the mound. <laughs> Religious, political, and educational meetings made the Grand Mound community prominent in very early territorial history. Grand Mound is now under the ownership of the Chehalis Indian tribe. The Reform School for Girls opened in 1913 for, quote, incorrigible, end quote, young people and was formerly named the State Training School for Girls. It later became a prison for juvenile male felons before it closed in 2011. The facility did not have fences until the 1970s and thus many escaped simply by walking away. The administration building is on both the state and national registers. By the way, Green Hill Reformatory School, a few miles south in Lewis County, near Centralia along Interstate 5, opened in 1891. Uh, and that was 1891. This is 1913, to give you a reference point. In 1870, seven women in the Grand Mound area succeeded in voting and had their ballots included in the final election results, in addition to eight women from the Black River District. Thus, this marks the first time women cast ballots in Washington that were counted in the final tally. Meanwhile, women in Olympia were turned away, and the polls became illegally, it was illegal for them to vote, so they were ejected. Mary Olney Brown, pictured here, was one of these women in Olympia. She was a nurse, a writer, a woman suffragist, and a wife of Benjamin Brown with a donation land claim that was filed in 1866, and a wharf just south of Butler Cove, if you know where I'm at. There's some names that replied to that. She and two other women had their ballots rejected in Olympia. Women's suffrage in our state is quite interesting. Arthur A. Denny of Seattle proposed an amendment to a voting bill to grant women a right to vote in 1854. The amendment was defeated by one vote. In 1870, 15 women and had their votes counted in Washington Territory and Grand Mound and Black River precincts, as stated earlier. Women earned the right to vote in 1883 by legislative action, but that right was taken away by court action. However, it was reinstated by the legislature in 1888. only to have the courts once again remove that right in the same year. Finally, the state granted women the right to vote in 1910, which was 10 years before the 19th Amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution giving voting rights to women. Sidelight, the first state that granted women the right to vote, 1870, was Wyoming. Okay, just for a sidelight, not on my notes. Fort Hennis was named for Grand Mound area resident named Benjamin Hennis, who was captain of the volunteers. The fort was built in 1855 to house local settlers who feared being attacked during the Indian War of 1855-56. 
The 100-foot by 130-foot structure serves several families of about 227 people from the prairies called Grand Mound, Ford, Bakers, Mima, Fords, and Wanch Prairies. This marker at the lower left recognizes the site of the Masonic Law, Grand Lodge Number 22, which also was located at the site during that time. The cemetery across the road was established in 1855 to serve pioneer settlers and child Shehalis tribal families, and it's one of the oldest continuously maintained burial places in our state. The Miller Brewer House was built around 1860 by George Miller, a territorial legislator and farmer. It was a big departure from the numerous log homes that were built in the area. The lumber came from a mill 10 miles away at Cedar Creek. The house is a rare example of the Greek Revival style of architecture in Washington, and it's again listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The image in the bottom left shows the uh, box frame construction. Reese Brewer purchased the property in 1873, and which at one time was the site of a post office for Grand Mound. The house and adjoining farm were owned by members of the Brewer family until 1962. At that time, the state of Washington purchased the property for a game preserve of over 900 acres. The meandering Scatter Creek, which originates northeast of Toninal, is part of the property. Thomas Rutledge came over the Oregon Trail in 1853 and settled on a preemption claim and built a log cabin in the Little Rock area, but then it was known as Black River. Rutledge built the original section of the house in 1861. He added a north wing in 1893. In 1879, Rutledge wanted to establish a post office and placed a rock in his yard, intending to name the post office The Rock, <laughs> the name by which the town became known. The post office was briefly named Viora, V-I-O-R-A, after the combined names of civic promoters. The Rock was utilized to assist people using horse-drawn carriages to, uh, as a stepping stone so they can get down off their carriage. Hence, in short, the Little Rock, small L, small R, south of Little Rock, the big L, okay. The barn was built in 1864, and it's one of the oldest in Washington, and it's a phenomenal barn. It is huge, uh, if you've never seen it. It's a fantastic barn. Beginning in 1870, camp meetings were held near Little Rock on land homesteaded by Reverend Harvey K. Hines. A church was built on the site in 1885 by members of the Rutledge family. In 1905, the church was moved to its present location and was remodeled in 1911 and 1912, adding an annex, a belfry, and a front entry. The bell actually comes from Fairview School. The community of Maytown was founded by Taylor Lumber and Shingle Company in 1911, taking advantage of a newly built rail line. The name was given by Isom No for his former hometown of Maytown, Kentucky. An alternate source of the name has been ascribed to a man named Joseph Shelley, who platted the town and supposedly said, well, it may become a town and it may not, so I'll call it Maytown. <laughs> to me, that's more enjoyable and more entertaining source for the name. The land for this state park was donated to the state in 1921 as a family memorial and named after Frederick Miller and his sisters, Sophia and Christina. Camp Miller, Sylvania, which means Miller's Woods, was home to several groups of Civilian Conservation Corps enrollees who developed the park in the 1930s. The well-preserved CCC structures are still in use in the park and perhaps represent one of the finest collections of such properties in the state park system. As a result, much of the park is listed on state and national heritage registers. Deep Lake, despite the name, has a maximum depth of 16 feet, and the park <laughs> offers camping, hiking, swimming, boating, and biking. 
Thurston County is also blessed with a number of historic sites in three incorporated cities in northern Thurston County, about which we may brag about. In the city of Lacey, originally named Woodland, you will find the following sites, including St. Martin's University, which was founded in 1895, and Olympia, originally called Smithfield, features such sites as the old Capitol building, which originally was the county courthouse, as well as the Bigelow House that was built in the 1850s, and of course the crown jewel on the hill, the state capitol building and campus. Tumwater, originally named New Market, meanwhile has these locales, and especially its iconic old brewery building. And this photo shows Tumwater before the construction of Interstate 5 and the creation of Capitol Lake. So here are my thoughts on the importance of history. And I wish to thank those people who have served and assisted on the County Historic Commission. Um, it's been a long 30 years, but on either or eight. I also wish to thank my wife who's sitting over in the corner because she has gone on many, many numerous road trips in Thurston County. I don't know how many times we retraced this route, but I even have it down to the mileage. I even have it down to the GPS markings. Uh, so. <laughs> I wish to thank you for attending the presentation. The photographs are all mine, and I hope that you will uh, go out and get on the county roads. I saw this sign many years ago. To me, it fits me to a T. So the bottom line is, it, it, if you talk to my wife, she'll tell you that. Thank you. I don't consider myself an expert, but I don't mind fielding questions, uh, particularly of where things are located and what have you. Um, my goal today was to try to encourage you to go out and visit your county and get off the freeways and stop at the two rest stops, or three rest stops, actually. The reason why it's in Grays Harbor County, the one sign, I know it's a little rumbling out there, uh, it's because it's the one that's coming in. My goal when I first went on the Historic Commission was to put the signs in each of the corners as you come into the county. Uh, the one we don't quite have yet that is the northeast corner. Uh, we don't have one at Yom or the uh, Nisqually Reservation area. I was working on that when I finally decided to step down. Um, but that's the only uh, one that's left. Uh, we do have one, though, in Rainier um, by the uh, trail there, if you ever know what I'm talking about. And I'll show you that on another slide, Joe. But are there any questions? Yes? At the Scatter Creek area, the Miller House, are they doing some renovation of the house in that area? We were down there yesterday and it looked like they were working on you caught me, I don't know. It's been a while since I've been there. So it's, it has in the um, good graces of the state. Um, they are trying to maintain, the last time I knew, to maintain the exterior. The interior is not in great shape. But um, there's a, obviously some new signs that they put installed. The, the sign I showed you here is a fairly new one done by the county uh, right in front of it. Um, so it's a hard uh, place to, to try to tell people how to find it. Um, so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is your map in front available either online or in printed version? Well, I sort of took a map and I made a copy of it and then I highlighted it. So please don't tell the map maker there's a small C with a big circle around it. Um, and so it's not available. <laughs> but if we were to come up and take a picture with our phone. I have no problems with that. My goal in the future is to, uh, and I got to thinking about this, um, whenever you, you make something, you, you tweak it, and you tweak it, and you tweak it. I don't know how many times I've done it. And I looked at this, and I thought, wow, I need to uh, incorporate these pictures into, uh, or portions of the map into the slideshow, and it'll give you a better idea of where we're located, but you're welcome to do so. <laughs> David, you finally, you did come. <laughs> 
the origin of the name Tanino. A, a railroad train by the name of uh, number 1090, a railroad car by 1090, uh, those are the usual ones, um, but incorrect. Um, Ben, uh, the story that I hear, Tanino is an Indian word that means a split in a trail. And one trail went to Puget Sound, the other trail went to uh, Fort Nisqually, Cutson's Bay Company, DuPont. So from what I can gather, it is a split in a trail. Um, incidentally, the county does have a book that's out uh, many years ago on place names of Thurston County. And the reason why Queenmouth Peak got named is that we were looking at places and discovered, wow, Peak is higher than Capitol Peak, and we had the opportunity. Uh, Queenmouth Peak is one of the very few Native American names at any site in the Cascade Mountains. It's uh, it was a rarity, and uh, Queenmouth is an interesting individual. Uh, if you ask about it, I'll do that. That's my next slideshow. But uh, <laughs> anyway, David, did I answer your question? All right, thank you. You can. Um, he's a, he a former student back there. It makes me feel old. Others? Yes? Um, where's the, you said the, the next slide show, where's the next one? It starts at Millisylvania. It will take in George Bush. I, mean, I mentioned that to see what kind of reactions I get because invariably they think of uh, somebody who was president of the United States and has nothing to do with him at all. But anyway, they'll include the kiosk with George Bush, which I think is the finest kiosk, finest sign that Thurston County Historic Commission's ever made. Uh, and it's over um, by uh, Kippert's Corner, if you know where I'm at. Um, so ask me later. But anyway, it'll go down uh, Old 99. Um, it will go to uh, Yelm. No, it will go to Tonino. It will take in uh, Bucota, it will take in Rainier, it will take in Yelm, Power Plant, um, um, Fort Eaton, the water site for the watershed part, uh, you know, for the water for Olympia on, uh, over by Nisqually. It will talk about Nisqually uh, Indian um, uh, things at that area, the Medicine Creek Treaty, Ptolemy Park, uh, Boston Harbor, and uh, so it completes the other circle part. And I think it's a little longer distance-wise. I never measure. I haven't measured this one for a while. But so that's what the other half does. You said you weren't going to do. You haven't done the, the Bald Hills area. Is there the Bald Hills to me was a tangent that goes off, and I'm trying to figure out what would I take a picture of when I get up there. I know there's waterfalls up there. I know the county owns a park up there that hasn't been developed. It's a beautiful area, but it's not accessible to the public. And, it, and so I did have a, got a tangent here, which is to get you to the Miller Brewer House. There's a little tangent there to get you off where I really wanted you to go. And the one uh, to Bucota is a one that is a tangent to get you out to, to uh, Bucota because it gets me a chance to talk about a territorial prison that's out there, a huge lumber mill that's out there. It gives me a chance to talk about the military road and all kinds of stuff out there. Yeah. <laughs> Others? Way in the back, besides my former student, you have been an awesome audience. I appreciate it. And Dolly, uh, I don't know how long it took me. Uh, Don Webb, uh, Don Trostler here uh, said 96 slides. You can get that done in 45 minutes. So how'd they do? You did great. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, all together, you probably looked at 125 pictures is what you probably looked at. And um, my philosophy to a lot of the talks, and there's nothing I put down on others, is that I want to see pictures going up and not see one for 20 minutes. And so I probably went too far the other direction, but hopefully it was entertaining. And I appreciate your attendance, and I appreciate uh, the questions I got. Thank you. This is a great program, so I hope you will support the uh, Olympia Tumwater Foundation. So, thank you. So, do you think we should have him back next season for our talks, <laughs> for number two? Okay, I think we're going to do that. Uh, we're working on the schedule now for the, the second, our next season of talks, and that starts in October, goes through June. And so we still have a couple more this season and this next talk it will be in may and that will be probably another packed house we're going to have to turn people away because we're going to talk about history being the basis for the future with the uh, the uh, craft brewing 
idea, the vision for a craft brewing center here based in Tumwater with our history, and then also the status of the Olympia brew house, the old brew house. And so we'll have two people from the city and one from South Puget Community College doing a three-way talk and making a presentation about the latest scoop on all of that vision. And so that's, I'm, that's why I say it's going to be packed out and we're going to have to be strict about it this time. <laughs> uh, and then also in June, John Dodge, former Olympian reporter, he's written a book about the uh, October windstorm back in the early 60s. And uh, he'll be talking about that in June. So come on back and make sure you grab a flyer or, or one of our calendars. And thank you so much for coming.